think I just drank my contact lens. It's there. I found it. I'm sorry. Always sorry. Welcome to episode 39 of the Columbo podcast, where we are always sorry, but have yet to drink our contact lenses. So very sorry. Did you drink your glasses the other day? I don't wear glasses or contact lenses, so I don't have that risk. Okay. How are we this evening? I'm fine. Fine? Yes. Is that all? Great, oh. good, but okay, fine. Been better, been worse. I'm not too bad, actually. Is that just a typical response? It's ah. too warm. That's my feeling. We've complained about this before, but we also complained that we've not had a summer. Both things are true. It's been warm, but not nice. Unpleasant. Yes, muggy. It'd be fine, actually, if we were strolling about this evening, going for a few beers here or there, but we're not. No. We're sitting in here in a... In a shut office with the windows jammed closed. Doesn't sound like they're jammed closed, but they're racket outside. We're doing our best. Anyway, we shouldn't moan. No, we should There shouldn't are people moan. who are worse off. There are. This is an interesting episode, Ian. What did you think? I enjoyed it, but people rave about this episode. Mm. And at least on first viewing, it wasn't one that jumped clear at the top of the list for me. It was good. It was a good episode, but I, I don't... Um, have it number one. I'll be honest with you. This has been a bit of a revelation for me. Going through these episodes in, in the order we we're doing it, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this was certainly my top five. In fact, at some point, when I perhaps was around 17, 18, I reckon, this would have been, would have been my number one episode, without a doubt. And watching it again recently for the podcast, and being more critical. It's not number one. It's certainly not number one, and I can see, I don't get me wrong, I still like it, but there are a number of weaknesses in it which have certainly devalued it uh, for me, perhaps perhaps even outside my top ten now. Ooh. But, um... I, mean, I was all excited, I was sitting there with my, my cornflakes and a mug of hot chocolate and my laptop ready to take notes, and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a treat. Wait a second. Cornflakes in the morning, yeah? Yeah. But hot chocolate's a nighttime warm drink. Why are you drinking hot chocolate with? I had the milk open, so I thought I'll just You'd make, make hot, some chocolate? hot chocolate. Yeah. Odd. Yeah. Will we crack on with this episode? Well, we've not got very much else to do. Although it is season finale, so we're going to come back to <laughs> it is, verdict. It? At the doesn't end of feel this like show. it because it's only the three uh, the three episodes. But yes, we have got that. Oh, actually, I forgot all about that. That's fine. We'll I'm make sure we can remember. Yeah, the last we should, two episodes. We always ask listeners on a season finale episode to think themselves about the whole season that's gone before. We're going to do verdicts at the end as if there were no confessions um, and there were competent lawyers representing the accused. So we've only got three to do, including today's episode, but we will still do it, keeping faithful to the format as we love to do. Yeah, and, and keep thinking yourselves and... and We'll get back to that. Find out if Columbo can redeem, redeem himself after last season's well, fairly... Season 5, he, he struggled to get a conviction, didn't he? Yeah, it was poor form. Oh, in our opinion. Mm, of course. Other opinions do exist. They do. Fancy giving us your summary of this well, week? Well, it is traditional. Go for it. In the Bye Bye Sky High IQ murder case... Oliver Brandt, a genius accountant, is discovered by his partner Bertie Hastings to be embezzling funds from clients. Aware that he's been found out by Hastings, Brandt plans to murder his partner and use his incredible IQ to get away with the killing. Facing the challenge of unravelling the mystery is Lieutenant Colombo, a smart man himself despite his protestations, with advice and suggestions from other geniuses to bear in mind. Can the underdog have his day? Or will the killer prove just a little too smart? Thanks, Ian. Quite an intelligent summary there, I thought. It was required. Mm-hmm. We start off in the Sigma Society at night time. Well, we, we start off with headlights approaching the camera. That's true. That's quite, a nice little opening Yes, moment. and it's quite an eerie score, I noted. Yeah, it was certainly ominous to an extent. Mm-hmm. We see a man who we come to learn is Oliver Brandt approach... The house of the society. Yeah, we see through the windows from the outside that there's a meeting in place taking, mm. you know, going on at the moment. So someone's standing up there talking to a, 
a smallish group of what yeah. 15 people well like you say it's the Sigma Society yeah. we don't know who they are but we come to learn it's a Mensa type high IQ group for people who are very pleased with themselves <laughs> they are very pleased with themselves uh, so this man this Oliver Brandt he creeps in he's got an umbrella with him we see he's not really built for creeping but he he's manages not. it he does they're all enthralled by this uh, the speaker and he sort of creeps up up the stairs he goes up to a study and he plays some music. The man that's talking downstairs is called Mike. Yeah. And he is uh, addressing the group and he's discussing how that um, he's joined the Sigma Society even though he's a mere welder. Yes. Who would expect a welder to have above average intelligence? <laughs> I think that's something that would be seen as a sort of a false narrative nowadays, but it, perhaps there were would. still stigmas associated with certain mm. professions in the 70s. Although I think that the, the IQ test or the IQ score has been pretty much debunked now as being not fit for purpose. Yeah, I think people are aware there's various types of intelligence. Certainly. Uh, but even this sort of traditional IQ test, in terms of you know, my understanding, is that it certainly favoured different demographics over others. And also these sort of tests can be manipulated you know, you can learn how to do them. It's like, you know, anything well, else. You can practice them. You can buy books and, and learn to become good at them. The thing that I was always taught is that doing well at an IQ test proves that you're good at IQ tests. That's all, yeah. And that's about the sum total. Yeah. It's the same as really when you go to school and you do your exams. All that proves that you're good at doing exams. It doesn't prove any kind of knowledge of anything. Yep, you can learn how to become good. You can learn to provide the answers that people... And indeed you're taught how to provide the answers. Yeah. And you're not... You go to school and learn a language. You don't learn to speak the language. No. You learn to pass an exam in the language. It's not That's much it. use whatsoever. George Bernard Shaw actually uh, describes sort of passing tests. If you, there used to be, it's not available anymore, but it used to be uh, archive audio interviews on the BBC website. And there were some great little clips with uh, Bernard Shaw talking about how to pass exams and get on in school and life. And they were, they were fantastic. There you go. Anyway, we digress. The man, Oliver Brand, is upstairs in the library. Yeah. He, he puts a record on a record player. He then starts to configure this quite elaborate alibi. Well, yes, he has a device with wires and clips inside his briefcase. Yes. Can you, are you able, Ian, do you think you can describe the alibi, the setup here? It's a tricky one. Go for it. He's got alligator clips to attach. Crocodile clips. Well, I would. A bit of alliteration. I would go with crocodile clips, but Colombo calls them alligator clips. Okay. So we'll go with his description. Sure. To attach. The various wired contraptions to others. Yeah. He intends to use the umbrella that he has with him to hold the gun and retain its position in the chimney. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's wired up this record player Mm -hmm. to make... I wasn't sure where the sound of the, the gunshots... Oh yes, the gun made the sound of the gunshots. Before being pulled into the umbrella and shooting up the chimney. No. No? No, no. Did I get that wrong? Yes. I'm completely confused. Where did the sound of the gunshots come from? They had uh, firecrackers. Right, so okay. what he did was he wired up firecrackers. I'm getting mixed up between the yes. theory that yeah. the, the other guy had. So yes. the firecrackers were uh, stored in the umbrella after the, the murder's taken place. Yes. What he does is he wires up the firecrackers to the, the record player. Which acts yes. as a detonator. Yes, well, the record player's got this arm yeah. that's moving. It, it contacts two points. Yep. So the wire from the crocodile clips on the, the record player go into the umbrella, which ha- contains the firecrackers, and the gun, which is up the chimney. And this ensures the firecrackers are not found. Yes. And the gun is not found. Yes. At the same time, there is a book poised precariously on the edge of a desk, mm-hmm. and the arm of the record player knocks a pen onto the book, which is enough to topple the book onto the floor, which I thought was a bit chancy. Well, that is part of the the whole sort of gotcha, isn't it? That it wasn't that chancy. It was balanced exactly as it should be. So any of that, that he, he worked out the weight of the, the marker pen is going to topple it. Well, that's either a fantastic calculation or well, it's a, genius. a bit fortunate. Because to be balanced so precariously that something as light as that pen could knock it off, there's uh-huh. a chance it could overbalance by itself, I would have thought. Yeah, possibly. But he is a genius. Well, Yes. We'll give him that, I think. Yeah, but you just think, to be balanced that precariously, mm. other events, someone stomping up the stairs or, you know, running into the wall downstairs, you know, anything like that sure. could have been enough to, to topple that. Sure. 
Anyway, that was the only part of the plan that I had a, yeah. a real question about, apart from not really understanding the firecrackers, because I was like, well, what was the noise from? Yeah. But that's that's fine, because that is that's, that's fine. So he then changes the record, and he programs it to start in the middle of a... Yeah, he's got an advanced record player that you can program in yeah. this way, which is, again, you see quite a lot in Columbo Hall mod cons. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it was very impressive in the day. The other chancy bit that... I, sorry, I forgot all about it, is that there's a wire going across the floor between the record player and the umbrella, yeah, which is to. still there when yes. everyone runs up the stairs. Although it's chancy, but your first reaction on seeing a, a, a friend or certainly a colleague's dead body lying on the ground isn't... Why is there a wire there? Yeah, well, you're relying, though, on that reaction. You're not... Yeah. These, are very, these can be very observant people. All it takes is one person... Because he manually winds the wire. Yeah, that's true. All it takes is one person to notice... And his whole plan is scuppered. We're getting ahead of ourselves here, aren't we? Well, yeah, well, we're talking but about the plan. This yeah. is how he's, at this point in the episode, he's setting up this plan. Yes. And it helps to understand what's going to happen. Okay. We get back down to the society general sort of living area room, meeting, well, communal room. Before that, we see him looking quite satisfied. I think he's content that the plan is in motion. Yeah. So Brant makes an appearance downstairs as a burglar alarm is being, quite conveniently, is being discussed. And he makes a joke that all they have worth stealing is Bertie, who I think is the chairman, uh, has, is his brain power. Yeah. Well, just before that, actually, there's another member of the audience stands up and criticises Bertie. He's unhappy that there's not another guest. Yes. And Bertie says he's not had time mm-hmm. to organise it. Of course, we, we come to learn that Bertie's been occupied with another matter. Yes. Which is probably why he hasn't attempted to book a guest. And it also gives us a sort of insight into the, his character that he is quite downtrodden so that these members feel able to in public sort of berate him for, for his lack of they don't fear his authority he's not someone that's, who they respect right. perhaps so he's yeah. easily taken advantage of yes he's seen like yeah almost a sort of a wet figure he's got no gravitas no that's correct this is for, for the first time after uh, Brand makes this joke about Bertie's uh, brain power he tickles him this is weird. It's very weird, isn't it? Not just the fact that he tickles him, but the reaction to the tickling is I think strange. it's a power thing. I think it's saying, I'm going to do this and you're not going to stop me. Definitely, and I think that is you know, highlighted shortly in the episode. It's quite amusing, the tickling, but it's, so, it's odd, isn't it? it? The first time it was quite amusing, but when they got to mm-hmm. third, fourth time, it was a little bit less. It just seemed a bit cruel. Yeah. Bertie gets the same treatment again. They're having a drink after the meeting. Yes. He gets the same sort of abuse. Mm-hmm. He's not and abused. He's not in any way amused. No. Um, he's abused, mm-hmm. but not amused. And he tell, yes, and he tells them that something is wrong. Yes, they, they go up to the library. Yeah. Before we head up to the library, and before I forget, did you notice a guest appearance at all in the, the meeting room? You can see it when the camera is behind Mike and looking out onto the audience. No. On the back wall, back left-hand wall, there is a portrait of Mrs. Melville. Really? The yep. one from the first episode? Yep. Is so it just reusing props, or is it yeah, a nod yeah. to Mrs. Melville? I think both, isn't it, really? Okay. Was there any rumours of the show ending at this point, or were they always going to come back for season seven? Well, I, don't, I think they were always going to come back. There was no... Was it a two-year deal that they got? I'm not sure how long the deal was, but I don't think there was any... It was highly successful, and I think the only... Previously, in the, in the previous uh, sort of negotiations, it was due to Peter Falk wanting more money. Yeah. So I don't think there was any uh, people wanting to cancel the show because it wasn't doing well. And in this, you know, at this point, I think after three episodes, he wasn't going to renegotiate. I don't know. I wouldn't have thought. Okay. You know, he had to. He, he got what he wanted. And because of course we're coming to the final season of the original run next week. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to talk about that some more mm-hmm. on that episode. So they go upstairs, as you say, to the library. Yes, Bertie explains. He's fed up. Yeah, well, first of all, they have this uh, word game that they play, isn't it? What is oh, it? Oh, they started that downstairs. Yes, they pick a, a page and a number out of the dictionary. dictionary and then they f- guess whether or not it's going to be odd or even or something like that. It seems to be a game that they play yeah. free, regularly. Bertie always uses the game. Yeah, no doubt it's stacked against him. Yep, and Bertie tells Brandt that he's sick of the way he's being treated and he's been taunted his entire life through school and college and now in their accountancy firm together. So they work, they, they, yeah. they're the partner, senior. He essentially, yeah, I think, yes, it's a very sort of um, 
subservient relationship almost I think Bertie's taken advantage of by Oliver yes Brant tickles him again that's crazy and Bertie has a reaction he gets serious he makes an accusation but not before giggling <laughs> yeah we've got a clip of his response no I'm throw running I know I know I know what you've been doing in the office, Oliver. I know how you've been stealing from our clients. I took the trouble to examine your accounts. I know you have. I'm well aware of it. Oh? Are you aware that I intend to expose you? Well, in that case, I intend to kill you. We were friends. I could never hurt you. I couldn't hurt you either. <laughs> you, 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 you thief! Bertie. You can't sort me out of it! I'll tell the whole world what you are! It seems that nobody hears Bertie yelling from just upstairs. I noted that myself. That's quite chancy. They're yeah. having a fight. And he's, he's shouting that he'll tell the whole world what he is. Mm-hmm. And he says, you're a thief. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, that did stand out for me. But the result is what? Well, Oliver says he already knew that Bertie knew that he was embezzling money. Mm -hmm. And he has to kill him. He shoots him twice. Well, no, he tickles him first. He tickles him first, yes. Just to give him one last humiliation, and then he shoots him. Yeah, twice with a silenced gun. Yes. Now, he then flies away on his umbrella, like Mary Poppins. (laughs) That's another chancy thing. How did he, he? How did he know that the body, when he actually did shoot him, wouldn't have made the third at that point? There you go. Anyway, he activates his um, his plan by hiding the gun in the umbrella, as we've discussed, and sticking it up the chimney. Yes. Along with firecrackers, which are attached to the yeah. record player. He then puts the final part of his plan into place. He balances the book carefully attaches the device with the clips to the record player, turns that on and moves the red pen into position. He almost forgets the pen. Yes, he does. And then he... I suppose that wouldn't have been the end of the world. Because they didn't, when the body fell, it didn't make a noise anyway. Yeah. So they would have heard the, the two shots and they would have gone up. run up and it just have been the body would have been lying there. Yeah. He also makes it look like a robbery. He steals his cash, Bertie's cash, from his wallet. Yeah. And then he actually says that he really did love him before he heads back down. It's not true. Well, yeah, it's quite, you know, I love a few people in my life, Ian. Probably wouldn't shoot most of them. No. And I think he was just used to taking advantage of Bertie. I don't think it was anything to do with loving him. I think it was just convenient to have him there. Sure. Which is sad, really. It is. When you think about it. Did you recognise Bertie? No. You've well, he had a familiar sort of looking face, but I didn't know who he was. We've discussed him before. Oh, okay. And he's quite a big t- well, he was quite a big TV star, and we've mentioned him before. What episode was he in before? Okay. I'll be surprised if you get this. He was in Swan Song. Okay. Let me think about Swan Song. Was he the aircraft engineer? No. Was he... Very short appearance. The manager at the start with the fee for the... He was the studio manager. There was a scene, a very short scene. When he was singing in the studio? Yeah. Okay. Recording manager. Ah, okay. Sorrel Book. We discussed him. He played Bertie Hastings. He died in 1994, age 64. He was in 146 episodes of The Dukes of Hazard playing Boss Hogg. We talked about that. We did. I remember that. Also in uh, MASH, Perry Mason, the FBI, Dr. Kildare and The Defenders. And The Defenders is something we'll talk about in the trivia at the end of this episode. Looking forward to that. Back downstairs. To, to the, the main room. The main area where they're all having their drinks. And so and the phone rings. Yes. And it's a, a birthday greeting. From? From the father of the uh, woman whose name I've forgotten. Miss Eisenbach. Is that what we're calling her? Okay. Yes. Um, but yeah, before that, Bertie firstly tells the room that the drinks are on him as Bertie has yet again lost his wager. Oliver his says, wager. yes, Bertie lost the wager, so yeah. Bertie's paid for the drinks. And Caroline, the younger member... She seems to annoy Brant a few times in this episode, and this is the first time because she knew what the the, the word from the dictionary was. It was um, Karina, which is a, a breastbone of a bird. And there's yeah, two, there's two definitions. Yeah, she but she knew the them both. 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're right. Miss Eisenbeck, um, Eisenbeck gets a call from her father. No, almost. Stepfather? No, no, almost. From her daddy. Oh, right, okay, yes, we've heard this before. <laughs> it was, yeah. So she got a call from her daddy, Mr. Swanson. Really? No. Well, there are names that come up in this episode that we've heard before. Oh, there are, yeah. We're going to come to those, but mm-hmm. they're quite specific. You've got Brant is the killer that was maybe related to Mrs. Brant from last week. Mm-hmm. Could have been. And uh, Danziger. Yes. The head of the Sigma Society is related to the guy from Troubled Waters. Because mm-hmm. there can't be more than one Danziger family. Not in the Columbo universe. No, in the same city. I'm no. not buying that they're not related. No chance. So as the music from upstairs comes to an end, they hear two gunshots and then a, a, they hear a gunshot, a thud and a gunshot. Yeah, they head upstairs. Yep. And this is where Oliver retracts that device. as yes. The, other sort of the wire, the yeah. Mm-hmm, he does. And as they inspect the body, as you say, he discreetly removes the clips and the wires from the record player. Now that, yeah, that is quite chancy. It's in full view of everybody. Yeah, they might have been saying, what are you doing? Why are you or doing that? Or someone could have just turned to say Oliver and... Seen him doing it. See him doing it, yeah. And become puzzled. Even to... if they don't know what's going on, no. they would be aware that Inside. something was going on when the yeah. police started asking sure. questions. We're back at the society, it's a crime scene now. Yeah. Members are grieving at the door as the body is removed. They're chatting and they suggest that perhaps a, a neighbourhood hoodlum may have broken in and uh, killed poor Bertie during the, uh, an act of robbery. Yeah. But Columbo's already solved the case without even on, before he's even on the screen. Yeah, he is uh, pretty much up to speed in this case, mm-hmm. isn't he? He has a colleague separate Oliver from the group and send him upstairs. It's a very weird one. So, you're right, a cop asks Brandt to come with him to the library, where he's asked to wait. Now, why would you do this? The line that Columbo gives is not believable. No. So, the only non-magical powers explanation that I have is that he wanted to speak to him because he was his partner and... Wanted to do it quickly before he spoke to other people too much. But you've put this guy in the room where there's a chalk outline of your, you have to assume at this point, Columbo does, your friend, long-term friend and business partner, even if it wasn't, it's, a, it's an acquaintance, it's a, a member of your society. Yeah. You stick him alone in the room with the, the chalk outline of the body and the well, floor. So. Quite disturbing, I would have thought. Yeah, so which is why you suspect Columbo has already solved the case. Hmm. Now, as Brandt uh, waits, he wipes his head. This is a weird one. Yeah, he wipes his head with uh, a handkerchief, which he'd obviously used before or or touched something before. You saw him turning it inside out at one point. It was almost like a a glove type thing. I think that was something different. Is that a different one? Yeah. No, because he stuffed that in his top pocket. Oh, was it? Maybe Mm -hmm. it was. Anyway, what happens is he wipes his uh, forehead. He gets soot in his head. He gets soot from the, the chimney. Yes. I think what he did was he used this thing, it's kind of like a long sleeve. Okay. Um, or it looked to me like a long sleeve, and he moved, used that when he was handling the gun. Sure. And obviously it's got soot in it, and then he turns it inside out and puts it in his pocket. Mm-hmm. But presumably some soot has transferred, yeah. so when he's wiped his head, he's got the soot from the yeah. chimney. He looks head. in the mirror and discovers this, and he panics, and there's a, it's actually, the tension is quite nice. It actually made me think of these, you see scenes in movies quite often when someone's killed someone, and they feel guilty, and they yeah. see blood on their hands. Yeah, yeah. And they, no matter how hard they wash their hands, there's still blood. It was that sort of thing. It's like it's almost like a uh, ash, like yeah. a, a mark of guilt on his forehead. Definitely. And he knows that a, a cop is about to enter the room to chat oh, yeah, to him. Yeah, so he he's panics. panicking. And he just gets rid of the uh, the mark just Very in time. efficient, because I think if you've ever had a, a soot mark on you, they don't usually just wipe off. No. Nope. They tend to smear and smudge and leave yes. residue behind. And then we have a great bit of misdirection, don't we? Because the door opens up. Yes, it's not Columbo. It's Caroline, the young, the young, the youngest member, Mens- eh, Mensa member who's fourteen. We'll talk, yes. we'll talk about that later. But um, she opens up the door and as- it quickly asks if she knows what's happened, and he he shouts and slams the door in her face. Yes. Have you solved the case yet? Yes. Do they know who did it yet? No. And Columbo reveals himself coming from the, the sort of back. I was never really sure what that room if it was a, a separate room or if it was just a. a a back exit. Or it anything. wasn't clear to me. I couldn't work yeah. out who was going to what door when. Anyway, there was another door. In yeah, front Columbo of comes through. Comes he says, there. gives this nonsense excuse. He's separated Oliver because he might need yeah. peace, given how close he was to and the victim. Brant's already on the back foot here, isn't he? Which is, you see, this is one of the the weaknesses I thought about this episode. You have a fully fledged genius, okay, yep. and I would have been more tempted, or I thought it would have been more appropriate to have him playing the very um, conceited. Uh, very confident 
role. It's, not, it's almost more bumbling, and it is quite bumbling. And he does. You never. You never. You never think that he's going to get the. You never think that he thinks he's in control. He's yeah. in control, and he's always kind of. Yeah, he's just just gets away with something or yeah. He's always stressing, isn't he? He's always nervous. It's, whether it's a suit, whether it's a, the, the gun in the bin that we'll talk I mean, about. That might be deliberate, though. You're showing that no matter how smart you are, you can't control these things. Columbo said only a few weeks ago that there's no such thing as the perfect murder. No, but I just think that this is perfect for. The, for a perfect type of Columbo killer, one who's so arrogant and really believes that he is smart. I mean, most of them do think that. Now, this guy knows he's certainly a very smart guy. He doesn't just think he's a smart guy. He is a smart guy. And I just think that we could have... That, that dynamic wasn't there. Yeah. The guy was right, as you say, right from the outset, Columbo sort of knew and put him in the back foot. And we didn't get the sparring and the dueling. No. That. There wasn't really any of that. No. There wasn't any point where... I mean, he was continually conscious of his own guilt but there wasn't any point where I got the impression he thought Colombo was conscious of it mm -hmm. where you could get that sort of realisation that yeah it's a game now yeah there's a couple of points where maybe but it wasn't Hammer Tome as well as what or, or, you know in, in a normal sort of way yeah anyway Colombo introduces himself he says that yeah he, he thought that uh, Brandt would appreciate being up there alone as the victim was his friend and partner yeah he explores the kind of nature of the society, finds out that they're all very bright folks. Yeah, top 2% of intelligence in the world. Columbo's impressed. Yeah, he didn't realise he was around such intelligent people. No. Columbo then admits that he's heard of Brant and Hastings. They're a very important accountancy firm. He probably heard about them when he researched them after he heard about the murder. And he asks about the music that was heard from uh, playing upstairs. And, and what does Brant say? He says he doesn't remember hearing or what he heard. He doesn't have a recollection. Yeah, but he says that Bertie must have put a record on after they played their word game. Yeah. And then Columbo says, why was the dictionary on the floor? That seems odd. And it, and Brandt is like, okay, yeah, that is odd. Uh, well, he must have left it on the floor. He can't... This is the other thing as well. He never... Yeah, he there's no clear reason why did he put it on the floor no. and for the thumb. But throughout the entire episode, I mean, Brandt never offers really sort of intelligent responses. He never comes up with any ingenious... Yeah, he's not... It's almost like he's thought the killing mechanism through, but he hasn't thought through... How do I actually get away with it? I can't think in his feet. I think that perhaps is, is, is reasonable that there's a different type of intelligence. Yeah. So this guy, he may be quite uh, analytical, but he's not good at being put under pressure. He also, obviously also wasn't good at getting away with embezzlement. No. Because he's been caught quite <laughs> no. easily. Yeah. I wonder if perhaps Bertie was the, the smarter of the two. I think that's you've got a fair... Well, yes, and Bertie was the chairman or... Certainly seem perhaps to be quite implied in the club. strongly. Yeah. So perhaps uh, an inferiority complex yeah. there for Brandt, and that's part of the reason why you would bully Bertie. Yeah, I think you've got a very good point there, a very strong point. Brandt then plays with a toy train set, and Columbo's quite amused at this. A guy of such intelligence can find uh, Yeah, and an adult as well. Yeah. yeah, I'd have a shot myself. I've never had a train set. And my friend had one when I was younger, or his, his dad did, but um, yeah. I never really got the. It was the a little feel. bit pat, but by the time, sort of, at our age, trains weren't quite, I suppose, as. You know, you know, there were people who would have a whole network set up and the train would have to run at a certain time. I was thinking, well, who's got the time for that? Yeah. It never really seemed, it was always like, well, yeah, you had to build this and it was all, you know, it was always, you didn't really interact with much with it. You pressed it and you sort of watched it go around. Well, there was a dial for the speed yeah. on some of them if they were, but I was never allowed the no. electric ones because I was too young and then yeah. I didn't care enough when I was old enough. But as a kid, you want to pick up and you want to move it yourself, don't you? You don't really just want to press well, it. As a button. young kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the electric ones are for adults. Oh, yeah. And for um, hobbyists. Yes. There's an interesting bit here, though, that geniuses are all convinced that they heard somebody leave, with the exception of Caroline. Yes, this is on the, the sort of stairs. They're outside yep. the, the room now. They've, they've moved down and they're talking. They're, we see other people. And Columbo is timing uh, how long it took them to arrive or to, to get from the, the general meeting room yep. to the library. Yep. After they heard the shots, obviously. And it was 40 seconds they came up with. And as you say, there is a, a lot of confusion about the characteristics of the killer. Yeah, but they all seem to have an idea, but it's all made up. None of them saw someone leave because nobody left. No, they didn't. It was nothing to do with what they looked like. It was by the sound. So how, how didn't fast did they hear nobody are? leave? Nobody left. No, that's true. So it's all imagined. Yes. They've, they've all imagined what they should have heard. Yeah. And they're recounting it to the police. Apart from Caroline, who said, I never heard anything. Yeah. It's like their brains are filling in blanks. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fairly well, maybe not to that extent, but I think it's a well-known phenomenon uh, within... Is that a phenomenon? Yeah. Ph ph what did I say? Phenomenon. Phenomenon. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, 
it's um, that that you know you ask seven or eight different witnesses about crimes and you'll get different responses. People will, things that you think are. Well, certain I think to, it's just that the brain fills in gaps. Yeah, it, it sees part and then it substitutes what it believes ought to have come in the gaps. Yeah, one of the other members of the society, the, the chap Ken the Welder. Okay, he was played by Kenneth Mars. He died in 2011, aged 75. He was probably best known for playing Franz Lipkin in The Producers. Okay. He was also in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Young Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, uh, Malcolm in the Middle, and he was in the original Sound of Music stage play. Okay. He was also in one of my favourite episodes of Murder, She Wrote. There was one where he played an ab- obnoxious lo- uh, writer, uh-huh. author. That guy who had a good career. He did. We head outside as Columbo leaves, and Brant suggests that perhaps Columbo may want to join the society. Well, this is an odd moment, because you've just accurately described Brant as being kind of concerned, worried, panicked, yeah. not in control, and now suddenly he is engaging Columbo in this offer, this invitation to join the society if he can solve a puzzle. But maybe he thinks that if he can... Get some sort of control over him, like with it could Bertie. Be, it could be that, again, this is just a harebrained, on-the-spot thing mm. that he's thought, oh, I know what I could do. Yeah. But Columbo is, you know, very self-effacing, and he says that Mrs. Columbo is sort of the brains of their, of the household. He does, but he's got a puzzle of his own. Yes. Brandt sets, um, no, firstly. Well, first, yes, Columbo set this challenge. By Brandt. Yes. Uh, will we describe it? Do you want me to do it, or do you want to do it? You do it. Okay. So it's the famous sort of penny scale challenge. You say famous, I'd never heard of this. Okay. Uh, it's famous to me. Okay. Of... So what we have is we have got two bags, or sorry, three bags of pennies. It could be anything you want. We'll call them pennies. I think he was told there were as many bags as he wanted. Yeah, it doesn't make any difference. Let's call it three, because that's what they use, okay? Okay. And one bag's fake. One ba- They've got a bag of fake pennies. Yep. The real pennies weigh X, which can be anything you want, and... The fake pennies weigh Y, which again can be anything you want. And you have a penny scale, which means you put one penny in, you can weigh something once, and it gives you a reading. And with that information, with those resources, you have to try and determine which bag contains the fake coins or pennies or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I struggled with it until I realised near the end that you could make up the weight of the pennies. And then it was easy. Yes, that's key. You assign whatever weight you yeah, want. It's, I hadn't picked up on that. My my understanding initially was that they have a weight and mm-hmm. the fake ones weigh more, but that you don't have a figure for that weight, which makes it impossible. Yeah, I mean, that's... But it, it does quite... I think that's one of your miss reading off it because yeah. it does clearly say it can be anything you want, so you can assign whatever you want to it. Yeah. Anyway, we don't need to get into this in too much detail. This is a sort of running... Not a joke, but a, a, a running aspect, a running theme through the episode here. Yeah, they come back to a couple of times. A couple of times, yeah. Now, yeah, Columbo then poses his own challenge back. Yes. I think we've got a clip of it. We do. You know, I got a puzzle myself, sir. Uh, as I understand it, uh, you people, you were all downstairs when you heard the shots and you ran upstairs to the library and that took about 40 seconds. But during that time, all the killer had to do was take the wallet out of your partner's pocket and remove the money. Ten seconds. What did he do with the rest of the time? I mean, 30 seconds, sir. That's a long time to hang around after you just killed a man. Yes. A logical question. Very good. I agree with you. I'm going to think about that puzzle, Mr. Brandt. You can count on that. Good night, sir. Good night. At this point, Columbo is in his car. Yes. And he pulls off right in front of somebody and they and crash their car. Yes. It's quite... <laughs> not just a little sort of dent. The guy nearly goes off the road. Yeah, it's a massive fireball yeah. and millions are killed. But you mentioned earlier, I think this is one of the, the times actually when Columbo does, or perhaps Brandt, is aware that Columbo suspects him because he's sort of talking about a dual purpose when he says, I will definitely think about that um, that puzzle. He doesn't refer to which one. Yeah. You know, so it's, he's actually going yeah. to think about the puzzle regarding his the own puzzle. Second, his own puzzle. Now, I think it's a great point he makes. If you have just shot someone, 30 seconds is a massive amount of time. I didn't quite understand this because 
Nobody heard him leave. Although they all say they heard him leave. Well, no, so who's they, to say he didn't leave immediately? The, no, they did. The, the, the door, that was the whole point. There was the, um, the door caused a draft. The window was opened, and when one door's opened, the other one shuts. So that was part of the plan. Okay. So he knew that. So they opened the door to see the other door shut, which is them assuming he's leaving. Yes. Really. And that was 40 seconds after, or 30 seconds after the shooting. Okay. So that was that. We actually didn't discuss that as part of the plan. You yeah. see him at the start, he puts a, he opens up the window. I saw him prop the window open, yeah. Book, yep. Because earlier he'd noticed that. So one door opens, the other one shuts, or vice versa. Yep. And that make, gives the impression. Okay. That also answers where Colombo came from. Yes. He's in another room. Another, well, there's another, another room. exit. There must exit, be an yes. exit, otherwise, why would he set it up that way? Yes. From there we go to Brant's home. And he arrives and he hides the, the wires. That sort of contraption under a plant before yep. entering the house. And he's shouted on by his wife, who I initially thought he called Vivica. And I was thinking, they can't use all these names again. <laughs> Vivian. It was Vivian. Yeah, she calls out and he responds quite despondently. We understand that perhaps the marriage is, it's not the happiest. It's under pressure because she can't stop spending money yes. in his opinion. Yes, we get that impression. Yeah. She shows off her glamorous new night attire. Until she realises that Bran isn't quite okay. And he tells her about Bertie. Well, she's upset that he's in a mood. Um, And before the talk, she clears more soot off his forehead. Yes. (laughs) But then, after learning about Bertie, she very, very quickly decides that they should, in fact, just enjoy life and go on a spending spree. Yeah, we must put Bertie out of our minds. (laughs) We'll take a trip, we'll buy some clothes. And he's got the sarcastic response, I'm sure you will. Yes. So his long-term friend and business partner has been murdered and she went, yeah, well, you know, let's not dwell on it. Let's, yeah. let's get the credit cards out and go on a trip. What's done is done. <laughs> Spend! A very odd response. We go from there to Brandt and Hastings, the accountancy office. Yeah, there's a secretary who appears to be leaving and Colombo kind of snoops around. Yes, so there's, there, there's secretaries are on, there's two secretaries, two male secretaries who are on the move. Yeah, and while Colombo's snooping around, the new one comes in yeah. who's not a fan of the old one. No. Colombo talks to Alvin Metzler. He was Hastings' secretary and has now been transferred to become Brandt's secretary. Yeah, he's not happy at all. No. But he gives some advice as to where he might find Brandt. Yes, he said he took an early lunch and he can normally be found in the park if that is the case. Yeah, that's critical information because yes. it almost spoils everything. Uh, but it's not quite true at this point. He's not in the park No, no, right but he now. will be. He will be. They have a little bit of a sexist chat there about men being secretaries. Well, yeah. Metzler, firstly, is, is very unhappy that George, who was Bertie's secretary, has now been promoted to be an accountant uh, above him. And this is actually quite important because there are well, reasons, reasons behind, behind it. It's, it's very yeah. important, yeah. And as you say, Colombo is amused by the male secretary situation and he asks the receptionist if it's a, a women's lib thing. Uh, yes. Everything must be a women's lib Well, thing. Yes, we'll, yeah. we'll let him have that. Yeah. Different times. Yeah, different times. Seventies. But the, the answer is fairly straightforward. The the firm likes to employ secretaries to the other accountants so that they can learn the ropes uh, from sort of ground up and then from there they're, they're moved into an accountant. It's essentially a training programme. Yes, that's what it is. They're not a secretary at all. They're no. a junior or whatever. Yeah. We go over to the back to the library. Yes. Where Oliver is doing something, recovering the umbrella and the gun. From the chimney. And from the firecrackers. Yes. So... We're now at the park. Yeah, which is a brief scene at the library. So Oliver has now acquired an ice cream. He has. He still has his umbrella and his gun and his firecrackers. And he's in the park and he's trying to dispose of the gun into a public bin. It's not the best plan. No, you would want to... Because that will be traced back. They'll find a, a gun and they'll be able to... I'd imagine there's a good chance that they can trace it back to where they picked that particular load up from. Yeah, especially if it's the park where he always goes for a walk at lunchtime. You think he goes to a completely different park. Yeah, or throw it in the pond or the, you know, the boating pond or something like that. Yeah. So there's, there's this tension as he tries to dispose of it, but he's accosted by Columbo just before he can get rid of it from his, yeah. his person. And Columbo does what he normally does, or often does, he tries to sort of break the ice by asking for advice for his nephew who wants to be an accountant. Yes, it's a lie. It is a lie. Columbo then admires the ice cream that Brant has and he goes off to, to get one himself. Yeah, well, just before that, you see, Brant is very uncomfortable with his umbrella. He's holding it funny. He's yeah. acting a little bit curious. Mm-hmm. He, there's no way Columbo's not noticing this. No, we'll get to that. Brant stuffs the gun into a 
a trash can, a bin. Yeah, and some other woman comes along with a pram and dumps stuff in the bin as well, and then the bin's removed. Yes, but before it's removed, he panics because when she st- stuffs something else in, it reveals his gun. Yes. And Columbo's starting, starting to walk back towards him, and he's panicking that Columbo's going to spot this. Yes, but fortunately, Columbo either doesn't see it or doesn't mention it. And a, a trash collector comes and, and takes, takes it away. away. Yeah. So there's a massive amount of relief, you can tell, in Brant's face and his persona. That's it. So much so that when Columbo uh, asks why he's carrying the, the umbrella in these temperatures. Oh, I must admit, this is a bit of a cheek, isn't it? Columbo's and never got his raincoat off <laughs> and he's wondering why why he carries an umbrella. Anyway, he's so relieved that he can, you know, he's palpably relieved yes. and he offers a relaxed explanation. Yes. Well, now, uh, I suppose you're wondering why I should bother on such a lovely day. That's what I was asking, the umbrella, yes, sir. In order to serve, an umbrella must be available at the first collision of seasonal clouds, the debut of a California drizzle. Now then, we must consider, where shall I be when the first rain strikes? Shall I be at home, in the office, in my car? Uh, shall I be at the club at lunch? Now we're dealing in probabilities. All right, sir, probabilities. Options, you might say. Options, indeed. Now, in the final analysis, I spend just 13 hours per day at my residence. However, there are other factors to be considered in this equation. Time at the office, time at the club, time en route, and dear me, we have not even mentioned weekends. Time on the golf course. On top of that, I may be called upon at any hour of the day or night to confer with a client. Where then should one keep an umbrella ready for instant use? Upon consideration of these and other variables, I have come to the conclusion, sir, that the one, the only proper place to lodge an umbrella, giving one the best play in the game of avoiding being rained upon, that place is precisely at home. Good day, Lieutenant. Yeah, so after all that, he comes to the conclusion that the house where he is all the time is where he should have his umbrella. (laughs) I really like that, uh, this overall performance by, uh, by Theodore Bickle. I thought that particular scene was great. Recently departed. Very recently. You'll be aware of that, Ian. He died just um, on the 21st of July this year. My birthday. Less, really? Yep. Yeah. So less than a, a month ago. Born in Vienna. He died there at age 91. It's a good run. Oh, yeah. He was a master of linguistics and languages. He spoke uh, six fluently. And he was, in fact, a real-life member of Mensa. There you go. He was also not just an actor but a renowned folk musician. And he had a number of uh, best-selling folk albums and he played a number of different instruments. So an all-round talent talent and entertainer. He was the original Captain Von Trapp in the Sound of Music stage play. Which along th- with... Yes, with uh, along with Ke- Kenneth Myers. There you go. Well, I think, I'm not sure if they were both... I mean, they might have been... The original run may have lasted... More than one, more than one year, session, right? yes. Yeah. So let's assume. But the, um, the very famous song Edelweiss was written by Rodgers and Hammerstein, especially for uh, Theodore Bickle to sing and perform. That's a very big claim to fame. Yeah. And he was twice Tony nominated, and he also has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Inevitably. Of course. Did you like his performance? I thought it was good. Yeah. But if you assume that what we've talked about is how they wanted them to be. Oh, yes. Then, yes, absolutely. Mm hmm. You can tell he's a, he's a very powerful performer. Yeah, he certainly has presence. He does. And charisma, I would say. A lot of charisma. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So, from the park, we go back quickly to the accountancy office. George appears with some fails and he suggests that Brandt may want to work on them at home. And I think it's implied that his promotion is a reward for... Keeping... These are probably the embezzled files and... Mm. Bertie's had them, so he's yeah. now recovered them from Bertie yes. and is giving them back to Brand to do whatever cover-up needs to be yes. done. So George is well aware of what's going on here. I think yeah. that was always very strongly implied by his promotion. Mm-hmm. And it's made explicit yes. later on. We're back off to the library. Columbo has his stopwatch again and he's timing things. He notices that the dictionary has a line drawn through it and there's a marker on the floor beside it. wonder why... Brant didn't sort of tidy up when he was back in retrieving the umbrella and yeah, the gun. Yeah, it's a strange one. Just leaving things lying around. Columbo also notices the thing with the door. 
Yes, he understands how the, the effect, how this has worked. Yeah, so now he knows there wasn't a killer yes. that ran away. Mm-hmm. Caroline arrives, and she has a theory that is almost correct. Well, she has a theory that's part correct, anyway. Yeah, she thinks that there was no burglar, and that it was a planned murder. Which is correct. However, she thinks that the shots that were heard were on the record. Which is not correct. No, because Columbo... He's played the record. Yes, and there's no shots on there. And then we have, for the first time in a while, another quite creepy 70s style moment. That oh, no, I think this is quite endearing. You think? Yes. Okay. So you think that a cop today investigating a murder would be within their rights to compliment a 14-year-old girl on how pretty she looks. Yeah, he's making the point that she's not just smart. And you think that'd be okay today, to reference her, her looks? Do you well, think an investigating officer would be... I think be... you have to give allowances for it being the 1970s. It's That's a more, my point. It's a more innocent time, yeah. and I think you have to appreciate that people enjoy these scenes with Columbo and the young girls. Some do. <laughs> that in itself you may have been okay, but she then responds by saying that she's happy for him to appreciate well, her. For she says, this is the very first time anyone told me they liked me for my body instead of my mind. Yeah. Which comes across as an inversion of a stereotype almost, and it's maybe a bit dated, but you can understand what they were trying to do here. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, an inversion. It was a, the stereotype was is the, the pretty a, girl whose mind was, is not recognised. inappropriately creepy. Uh, no, about, uh, no, to- but, talking about a 14-year-old girl's body and how she's pretty is... You can, yeah, they made her 14, which is a bit unfortunate. But you can understand what they're, they're playing on the idea of I know what the, doing. the pretty girl who isn't yeah. respected for her intelligence. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that a cop should be not be interested in... in Talking to her about her prettiness or otherwise, they had to investigate a murder and trying to, you know, you know, give her confidence about her looks is not nothing to do with him. Yeah, but you I can think only you can only overstep the mark. They use Columbo for this because he's a harmless figure. He's known to yeah, be a happily I'll, married I'll, I'll man who would yeah. not be a predator. <laughs> yeah, we only have to look at what's going on in the UK just now. To I'm sure there would have been quite a few people who had been regarded as you know harmless old men. Well. We don't want to digress down this this rabbit hole no. too, too too much. But it was the seventies, and there was not no no harm intended. I don't think. Yeah, and Columbo's about to leave yes. when Danziger shows up. Yes, he and he's not wary of Columbo, even though his relative was put away on Columbo's say so in troubled waters. Oh yes, oh, yes. Didn't know what you're talking about there. We just I thought I, missed, this. I know, but I thought I'd missed a scene. <laughs> yeah, uh, he arrives and he confirms firstly that it was odd that the dictionary was lying on the floor. Yes, and then he's got a suggestion. Well, he does, but before that, Columbo gives a critical piece of information. Yeah, he points out that both the bullets entered at the same angle. Yes, which rules out shot thud shot. Yes, definitely. But the man says that still fits with his theory, which is suicide. It's suicide with some kind of elastic device to pull the gun up a chimney. You see, I'm starting to really now, but with Caroline and Danzinger's uh, explanations, only an idiot would come up with that because it's so easily disproven. But he genuinely believes it's true. He's so devastated when he sees that he's wrong. But you can see it in his face. His face just falls. Yeah, but I, really like, I think you can pinpoint the exact moment yeah. his heart breaks. Yeah. But it's just a, a not... You know, even, at that, even if it was true, it'd be a really... Either way... This is this looks bad for these so-called geniuses, genies, yeah. because one, if he is correct, then you have another genius set up a murderer which leaves the gun hanging from a bit of elastic in the garden. Yeah? No, if he's correct, it was a suicide. Sorry, yes, uh, so, a, a suicide hanging from the, you know, so the whole point of the suicide was to not invalidate life insurance. Yes. But that's going to be immediately established because there's a gun hanging from an elastic band. That doesn't prove it was suicide, anyway. Yeah. Done that. <laughs> yeah. So, either way... So my note says he suggests the elastic pulled it away up the chimney, but um, tisn't. Tisn't, yes. Chimneys and outside windows with screens. <laughs> yeah, that's guys. I'd be saying, are you, sure, are, you, are you sure you're actually a member of this club? Yeah. That's a ridiculous... She's only 14, right? So she'd get away with it. But you, and you're the chairman... Well, you know, when you've ruled out everything else, whatever yeah. remains, yes, no matter yeah. how unlikely... I don't think everything else has been out, uh, ruled out at all here. I think they're just coming up with daft theories. Pulling them out of the air. Yeah. It's pulling, pulling them out of somewhere. Rain, conveniently, um, because Brian has his umbrella at home. And this is where we are. Almost. Okay. 
there's one other thing. Columbo has told uh, Danzinger yes that he's checked about he's checked up the chimney yeah. and that the lab boys have hoovered up some carbon. So there was uh, this soot. So something's been disturbed in yes. the chimney area. And then, as you say, we go back to Brant's home and Columbo arrives in the rain. Yeah, he's not brought his raincoat. He's not. Um, Which is an excuse to have his umbrella. Yep, and he leaves it in a a holder, an umbrella it's stand. The old switcheroo with the umbrella, which we saw done accidentally in Dagger of the Mind. He says he at the end he didn't. He actually didn't mean this, and I think I believe him in this case. I don't mm, think I'm not sure. I think he's done it on purpose. How would he know that there'd be an umbrella there that he could easily swap? Branch told him that he keeps his umbrella at home. They had the whole discussion. Yes, but you wouldn't assume that right beside the door it's the same same type of one, and I also think... that you can that uh, there'll be an umbrella holder there that you, you can easily swap. Well, I think that. Uh... Umbrella holder by the door is traditional in a wealthy family home. Yeah, maybe. You don't want the umbrella dripping up your hall. You don't. Yeah. Anyway, we then get the same exact thing that we had two weeks ago that we had in Ransom for a Dead Man, that we had in Exercise and Fatality, where the device that the killers use to help pull off the murder happens to also be in their home or in their <laughs> office. Yes. And Columbo is shown it by them. Yeah, so Vivian invites him in and explains how the record player can be programmed. And also that it can turn itself off. Mm-hmm. She initially wants to demonstrate it by playing Sinatra. But Columbo picks the record that was playing at the time of the Tchaikovsky, murder. Tchaikovsky, was it? I yeah, think. it was a Tchaikovsky record. Oliver comes in looking a bit disturbed because he's hearing the music that was playing mm-hmm. in the library. Yes. Um, but he settles and Columbo asks whether Bertie liked Tchaikovsky and almost cruelly Did Oliver explains that Bertie couldn't appreciate music. He liked everything um, because he didn't understand what was good. Yes. Tin ear, he says. Yeah. Bran offers Columbo some red wine, which he accepts, but I don't think he actually drinks. But Columbo decides he's going to leave. So I don't know why was he there in the first place. To get the umbrella. Yeah, but what was his excuse for being there? Um, he didn't. This was weird. He didn't really say anything. Yeah. Yeah. He just sort of turned up and then left. Left. And before he leaves, Columbo quickly asks some question. Uh, question about the the, the coin puzzle again. Oh well, yeah. No. He asks about how often you can weigh things, and he's correct until you can only weigh things once. Yes. Vivian Brand was played by Samantha Egger. She was born in 1939. Oscar nominated in 1966 for The Collector. Uh, and for the same role, she won best uh, a Golden Globe Best Actress and Best Actress at Cannes that year. She does a lot of, sort of voiceover work. Hercules, The Legend of Prince Valiant, to name a couple. She was in Matlock, The Exterminator, Magnum, and she was in Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation, where she played Marie Picard. Marie Picard's mother or wife? What episode? I don't know why you're know? asking me. I'm trying to think. I think it was one called Family or Families. Yeah, so that's right after the best of both worlds when Picard's been changed back from being a Borg and he goes home for a bit of respite. I think it's his, actually his brother's wife. Okay. Anyway. We won't dwell. We go to a disco. Yes. And there's some fantastic disco music and we, there's a girl Susie who introduces herself to young George. George is the secretary yeah. who's now been promoted to accountant. I've got a very yeah. quick clip of this. See if you can make sense of it. Hi! I'm Susie. Hi, Susie. I've tried Esalen Primal Scream, Pyramid Power, Synanon, A Black Mass in San Francisco, Open Marriage, Est, T-A-T-M, I'm okay, you're okay, and I'm still a target. Okay, theories. It could be forms oh. of martial art. Could be, could, could be, drugs? be certain types of positions of something or Defense other. positions? Could be, yeah. Uh, it could be, I have literally have no idea what she's rambling on about. If anybody knows, answers on a postcard. Yeah. I, to mean, I, th- I assumed it was initially it was drugs, but then it's such a lot of well, nonsense. When she says I'm still a target. Yeah. F- yeah, I have literally no idea what she is babbling about. I'm guessing it's martial arts of some kind, but I'd, or defence, self-defence classes. Really? That's my guess. Why would you... Introduce yourself to someone at a bar by saying that. So he knows not to try and take advantage of you? Really? To be honest, yeah. she's got victim written all over her. Well, that's what she says. She's still a target. Yeah. Because she approaches strange guys with that sort of pattern, that's why. Could be. <laughs> anyway, she sort of sits, plonks herself on George's knee as Columbo appears with a brawly and then she, he sort of sits on Susie. And George is not happy about Columbo's appearance. 
And then Colombo threatens George, doesn't he? Well, that's why he's there. It's very, very sort of abrupt, isn't it? Yeah. He basically says that if George knows a felony has been committed, he will be implicated and he also will be held responsible to some extent. Um, George is very melodramatic. Yes. Susie compliments Columbo on how he wears his hair and he returns the, com- the compliment to her. You're not saying that's creepy? No, she is, uh, what, 25 anyway? And she's old enough to be at a disco and do open marriages or whatever it is she does. So, um, Columbo's quite entitled to flirt if he wants. She's not a 14 year old. I don't uh, think he's flirting, girl. I think he's just genuinely being. Complimentary, right, which is fine. Yeah, with another adult, you can you can say what he wants in that sort of setting. Not when you're at work investigating a murder and you're talking to a child. Well, if you say so. Yeah. That's George says he wishes he was dead. Yes. He knows he's in some sort of bind here, doesn't he? Well, yes, but next day we're at the a restaurant cafe, part, maybe perhaps part of the yeah. office complex. You've got a. Meeting between George and Columbo, who has a donut that he's brought in from outside. And yeah, she's not paid for. Jamie Lee Curtis is not very happy about that. No, she's not. She says, listen, I'm trying to work. I'm doing this. I'm working on Halloween shortly as well. Um, I'm trying yes. to get my career off the but ground and you're yeah. eating a donut in my restaurant. So she takes it off him and makes him order another one from their selection. Yeah, I quite like that little bit of comedy there. It was nice, nice touch. And as you rightly pointed out, the waitress was played by Jamie Lee Curtis. And we have seen her mother... Play not that ago, Grace, Forgotten Lady. Grace yep. Wheeler, yeah. Mm-hmm. She played the, the killer. She was. In this scene, basically, Columbo explains to George that he knows that uh, Brandt had lost a lot of money on stocks and basically he needed cash. Yeah, well, also, uh, Mrs. Brandt can't stop spending. Yes, that's what's implied there. And George confirms that Brandt has, in fact, been um, sort of sifting funds from client accounts. Yeah, well, what he says is he saw Alvin fiddling with Brandt's files. Mm. And when he reported this to Brandt, that earned him a promotion. Mm-hmm. Brandt then arrives as Columbo leaves, and George admits that Columbo was discussing... Yeah, well, Columbo has a wee cover story asking about... He's, he's still talking about his nephew, how yeah. to get ahead, yeah. which is a sort of a pointed comment, how to get ahead in accountancy. Yeah. But and George, George confirms that's not what they were talking no, about. George is a little sneak, isn't he? Well, I think George is fully bought into um, Theodore Bickel slash Oliver Brandt's position here. He's on his side. He's going to stick by him. This is his man. Yeah. I think also the fact that he might have been... Could the reverse have worked? Columbia knows that he's in trouble if Brandt gets done for this. So perhaps he's trying to, rather than jump ship... Yeah, he's trying to double down. Double down and say, listen, we need to sort this for the, for both our benefits. Yeah. They've got a nice piece of direction here where they zoom in in the office window mm-hmm. and they set our segue. Yeah. And it's Brandt and Columbo in Brandt's office. Yes, Columbo is waiting for Brandt when he arrives and he's sitting in his chair. He is. And he tells him that he thinks that Bertie was in fact involved in some unscrupulous well, business practices yeah. aided and betted by, uh, by uh, Alvin. See, this Columbo knows that Brandt knows this isn't true. Mm-hmm. Columbo knows that Brandt knows Columbo knows this isn't true, but he gives him this line to see if he'll take it up. Which is? Um, that that was why the files were dodgy, that it was... Bertie, who's the bad guy, and that um, Brandt perhaps discovered this, didn't mm-hmm. know what to do, and he, he gives a little pointed comment here. Tell he me. says, um, Brandt says he needs to think about it, mm-hmm. and Columbo says, oh yes, sir, I understand. You'll certainly need time to think, mm-hmm. as in come up with something, decide whether you're going to come up with something that fits this narrative, yes. and essentially confess so that's what I'm saying. There are a couple of points where I think that there, there is that knowing between each other. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you're right. Maybe I was wrong with what I said at the start. Columbo leaves, and Brant's obviously in a rage here. He's he's panicking. He knows he's in trouble. Yeah, and Alvin mistimes his approach. Oh, I had dreadful, <laughs> I had dreadful time to ask for, you know, promotion or or some different working conditions. He gets destroyed. By Absolutely, Brandt. run right through. Here we go. Mr. Brandt. What is it? I owe it to myself to express my dissatisfaction. 
I was clearly in line for the position that you gave George. You dare to tell me your position in this firm, you niggling little twit, you self-serving, ambitious lout. Maybe Mr. Hastings took this abuse from you, but I certainly will not. And you'll take it too, Alvin, twentyfold. You'll be a secretary here until you're old and grey. And if you try to work anywhere else, I'll pull so many strings that you'll strangle in them. But that's Now go back to your desk. Suddenly, Alvin, you're a great choking stench in my life. Get out! I thought it was reasonable in the circumstances. Yeah, I don't think uh, Alvin will be chopping no, his I think, door again. But Alvin deserved what he got <laughs> there. Well, I'm not sure if he deserved Well, he's just done the dirty on his boss, essentially, by getting all those files. Yeah, sure. For so, Bertie and exposing him. Although you could say that was for a good purpose. I mm. think that it's not very loyal. No, it's not, it's not, it's not loyal. So Brant's not happy and he gets home. He's still not happy. You no, know, he slams the, the door as he, as he comes in in a rage. But then he makes a perfectly reasonable request and she's all off hand with him and. Yeah. But he's starting to unravel here, isn't he? Yeah. He confesses to embezzling the funds and she doesn't care. She's not interested. She's just trying to act like it's not happening. No support, no gratitude, no, uh, yes, no moral. Nothing really wifely at all in their relationship. That's what I'm saying. Other than a bank balance that I, she can access. Yes, I think this does back up the the supposition that she's in it for his. She's not his a very three dimensional character. Yeah, she's not. It's a very sort of stereotypical role. Um, I don't think those people really exist. Yeah, to act that way. We'd hope not. She coldly tells him, "Yeah, she wants to hear nothing." He tries to explain, and she basically cuts him. He's essentially cuts him pleading off. for her. Support. She says, nope, not interested. Yeah, but he is relieved by a phone call. He has to go up to the Sigma Club. Yeah, well, the relief the relief is very short-lived, isn't it? Well, relieved as in the sort of military sense of yeah. he has to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he goes to the club and it's very atmospheric. Well, it's ominous weather, lightning. Thunder. And when he enters, it's dark. It's there's nobody dark. about and the mouse is running in its wheel. Mm-hmm. He hears the music playing from the library upstairs. And in a panic, he, he heads up there. And then here's the gunshots. He turns gun. to leave. Yes. But he's met by a, a Sergeant Burke who directs him Yep, back stops up. him from leaving. And then Columbo shouts down and uh, Brandt is Someone, taken up to the library. Yeah. Columbo shows him the arm of the record player. Yeah, the clips have made Scra- scratches. Yeah. And how it moves as yeah. well. Columbo then starts the record again and he notes that it starts in the middle and last. Four minutes. Precisely the amount of time between Oliver leaving Bertie to when the gunshots yes. occurred. But you're going to be, I know that you're going to be angry about this. Okay. Call records from Memphis. Yeah. Show that it was four minutes. Yeah, so whenever the, you know, whenever it's convenient, isn't it? Call records. I'm not angry about it, to be honest. Maybe I, you have to go through a certain system to get a cross state call, and that's why it's recorded. Or perhaps just whenever it's convenient to the. The writers. That does make sense because the calls that they had records for in Murder by the Book were ones that were placed via the operator because mm-hmm. he did that to avoid his wife finding out. And this one's placed via an operator, presumably. So maybe that's where the Could be. records are available. Could be. It's the operator's records. Possibly. But then, from a more sort of practical stance, these episodes are written by different people, as we know. So maybe some just like that sort of clue. Yeah, I'm not having that clue. I want a better clue. Yeah. I'm going to do something different. Yeah. Uh, Columbus solved the gold pieces puzzle. Yeah, but, yeah, but it, it, the way he says it, he says, "I know exactly what you did, uh, what and how you did it." Yeah, and yeah. Brant thinks he's taunting. It's, yes. yes, the way that Brant would taunt Bertie. Yes, but he's, of course he's, ref- he's referring to the gold sack puzzle. I think he's referring to both the puzzles. Yes, I think he is. What I've got here is yeah, he's pu- pushing him to the verge now. Brant is about to break down here, isn't he? I think Columbus is essentially setting up an implosion. I think he sees this guy as teetering on the edge. Mm. And rather than having concern for his mental health, he wants to close the case. Yes. He tells Brandt that uh, Mrs. Colombo worked out the gold puzzle solution. Yeah, it's fairly simple. As we said, once you know what everything weighs relative to each other, it's fairly straightforward to Do get Do you want to answer. explain it or would you just leave well, it? Three, well, yeah, we'll just explain it because it was in the episode, folk will know. But three bags, one with fake coins, two with actual gold. If you consider that gold weighs one unit, yeah. and the fake gold is 1.1 units, then you take one coin from the first bag, two coins from the second bag, three coins from the third bag. If the total weight is 5.1, the first bag's gold. If it's 5.2, the se- it's fake. 5.2, the second bag's fake. 5.3, the third bag's fake. 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. 6, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 
I added five. Uh, three plus two plus one, I got five. <laughs> anyway, this is why I'm not in the Sigma Society. Yeah. So, yeah, so he's worked that out. Yeah, and Columbo then has almost a, a lecture about the value of hard work over genuine intelligence as a, or solely intelligent. I have a clip here of this, and the reason why I've got this clip here, normally we, we have a clip which sort of sums up the murder, uh, the, the solution to sort of gotcha, but this is the last clip of the this podcast episode. And the reason I've got this is, as I said, this used to be one of my favourite episodes, and this was my favourite scene. You know, sir, it's a funny thing. All my life I kept running into smart people. I don't just mean smart like you and the people in this house. You know what I mean. In school, there were lots of smarter kids. And when I first joined the force, sir, they had some very clever people there. And I could tell right away that it wasn't going to be easy making detectives as long as they were around. But I figured that if I worked harder than they did, Put in more time, read the books, kept my eyes open. Maybe I could make it happen. And I did. And I really love my work, sir. I can tell you do. There's one thing I learned, Lieutenant, is that we all have a cross to bear, including those of us who seem most fortunate. The rhythm, the sort of cadence, the, the whole sort of styling of that that scene, and what follows on from that clip, you've got Brant's sort of response where he mentions that you know people with greater intelligence don't have it as easy as what people might assume. I really just I, I liked it, and if you watch it as well, it's not just what he's saying; it's how he does it and what he's doing as he's talking. He's un, he's unwrapping a cigar and he, he puts it in initially the wrong way, and he has to turn it around. It's just a fantastic little. I think it's just Falk being Columbo. At his best, in my opinion. Peak Columbo. Yes, that just that one that for that one scene, it really just sort of wraps and sums it all up. Oliver follows this by saying he's bored. The people in the Sigma Club, they yeah. don't challenge or interest him. Columbo has a puzzle for him though, and essentially he's going to taunt him one last time into an ultimate conclusion, an ultimate confession. He talks about the gun and the squibs. They talks about the suit and the umbrella. He works through his theory, the wire from the umbrella and the fireplace to the record player, but he's stuck in one point. Which is? The dictionary. How do they make the dictionary drop between the shots? And he reveals that Danziger solved it. Yes. Just before we get that final sort of gotcha or reveal, he also mentions about the, the umbrella that he was looking for. Uh, he found burn marks. Yes, they, they, checked, they saw the, the burns from the. He the mistakenly, yeah, off, he yes. mistakenly uh, took his umbrella from his home when he was in that, that night, and that's yeah. the burn marks. Yeah. yeah, so, sorry, go back to where you were. Yeah, so he, he reveals that Danziger has solved it. It's the vibrations. The vibrations made the dictionary fall. And he's done this deliberately to antagonise Brand into confessing. He can't, he can't have Danziger. He's some, you know, uh, Danziger solving it apparently with uh, some subpar solution. Yeah, that would never work. No, only a fool would come he up with that. He wants to show that he was smarter. He wants yes. to show that he knew. He says, if I had done it, it would be like this. So he puts the pen up. The pen gets knocked off by the record player. It knocks the dictionary down and then he suddenly realises what he's done. Yes. And what does he say? Does he not say something along the lines of, oh dear, oh dear? Yeah, yeah. I think it's just a general expression of regret. Yeah. He knows he's been outwitted. Yeah, and it, his ego insisted that he revealed... He, you've not seen a lot of his ego in no. the episode. There's bits of it. There's the bit where he's taunting Bertie and there's a little yeah. bit here and there. But on the whole, he's been more sort of uh, frazzled than arrogant. Yes. But here his ego won't allow him to be convicted of murder for a lesser plan than his actual one was. Correct, yeah. And then the phone rings, and it's his wife. Yes, and she asks him to come home, and he says he's not coming back. And he seems quite relieved well, at I that think point. This is, reminds me of any old port at the end of that episode where there are things worse than prison. Yes. And perhaps he does have a certain amount of relief about not having to deal with her anymore, yeah. given that she is such a two-dimensional character. He asks what the, the the sort of first clue was, and Columbo confirms that it was the record player. Yeah. Uh, Brand's impressed by Columbo and asks about his his IQ. Yeah, he gives him a little word quiz. Yeah, which he passes very easily. And he asks him if he uh, would ever consider another line of work. He what? doesn't have any interest in that at all. He, he enjoys no. his work. He says, no, he could never do that. 
Yeah. And the episode ends. And again, that's maybe a hint to viewers that Columbo will be back next season. Yeah. Nice episode. Lots going on. I thought maybe one or two characters that we didn't need in there. Yeah. The girl on the phone could easily have been Danziger or Caroline. Yes, I think so. Um, I you think, didn't need two secretaries. No, I think the fact... Yeah, the secretaries definitely, but I think if you're... The whole sort of aspect of a club of geniuses, you couldn't really have only two people. It wouldn't look like a club, would it? Maybe. I'm just trying to fill it but up. You had, yeah, but there were more non-speakers. I think you could have just had others anonymously there. No, I agree. Because I the agree. more folk that speak, it just kind of muddles things. Yeah. It? Especially for me taking notes. I have to remember all their names. Yeah. Oh, you'll be happy next week then. Okay, looking forward to that. Um, yes, do you want to do the episode summary after the trivia or shall we do this trivia and then do the season summary and just roll it into that? Your choice. I think we do the trivia now and okay. then we'll just do a season summary at the end. Okay, okay. Production information. 22nd of May 1977 at the 70 minute mark. So a short episode. It was, but it you know it filled the time. It, it wasn't did. There wasn't lag or no. any sort of pacing issues with this mm-hmm. one. The director was Sam Wanamaker. Is he related to Zoe Wanamaker? He died in 1993, aged 74. Known for movies such as Raw Deal with Arnie, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, Private Benjamin with um, Goldie Hawn, Superman 4, which was atrocious, and The Defenders, which we'll get to, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And you are quite right. He is the father of Zoe Wanamaker, who, for us in the UK will be aware of her for her roles in My Family, Love Hurts, and you know her from... Harry Potter movies? Yep. Who she, she played who? She was Professor... Oh, she I, refereed the Quidditch matches. I've got here Madam Hooch. Madam Hooch, okay. Yeah, no, I remember her from, yeah, the one with Robert. Yeah, My Family. My Family, yeah. Also, interesting connection, Sam Wanamaker... She raised a lot of money in his name to restore the globe, which is now the Sam Wanamaker playbook. Yes, it is. That's correct. Yes. I know that without having to look up any trivia. Very good. <laughs> he was also, as others have been in the past, blacklisted by uh, during the sort of McCarthy witch trials. Along witch with trials. Lee yes, Grant. Lee Grant. Yes, and lots of other people. Yeah. This episode was written by Robert M. Gung. Not a familiar name? No, but we mentioned him once, I think, in Dead Weight, I think. Okay, episode three of season yeah. one, I don't remember. He was born in Edinburgh. Okay. Just along the road from ourselves in 1924. He came from Edinburgh. He did. And uh, he's Probably not noticed the, the, <laughs> no, the slight accent no. change there. No. Uh, he's directed things like the, the FBI, Kojak, Serpico, The Streets of San Francisco, uh, Escape, uh, sorry, Spencer for Hire, which is, I've mentioned before as well, I think, based on the uh, some uh, my favourite private eye books. Uh, the Spencer novels by mm-hmm. Robert Parker and he also directed Escape to Witch Mountain which is why I mentioned him before because that starred Eddie Albert who played General Hollister in Dead 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 Dead. Yep. yep, the only couple of bits of trivia I had related to the Mrs Melville um, picture and obviously Jamie Lee Curtis but I've got one rather I'll have to go through it quite quickly so the Defenders, directed by Sam Wanamaker, one episode anyway, mm-hmm. keeps cropping up. I've not really mentioned it with the guest stars of Columbo. Yeah, you seem to have skimmed it. Yeah, but I think it may rival Star Trek with regards to the amount of associations it has. How long is your list? Quite long. But do you, have you watched the movie Ted? I've watched the first one. Okay, you remember the bit where he's listing the... Uh, white trash names. Yes. Can you do it like that? No. Oh. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, the Defenders ran from 61 to 65, and it was about a father and son legal team, and they were sort of handling contentious and important issues of the day, so probably sort of race and abortion, that type of stuff, which were quite, um, you know, edgy back yeah. then. But uh, lots of guest stars. These are just the ones I'm aware of, without doing too much research. There are probably more. Okay. Okay. Quickly go through. William Shatner, Tim O'Connor, Sam Wanamaker, Martin Sheen, Colin Wilcox, Paxton, Michael Strong, Dana Elkar, Patrick O'Neill, Richard Kiley, Leslie Nielsen, Don Gordon, Robert Loggia, 
Joanne Linville, Jessica Walter, Lee Grant, Valerie Avery, Kevin McCarthy, Dean Stockwell, James Gregory, Martin Landau, R- Ricardo Montalban, Donald Pleasance, Robert Walker Jr., Kim Hunter, Louis Zorich, Julie Newmar, Sorrel Book, George Gaines, Sam Jaffe, Henry Jones, Joyce Van Patten, Basil Hoffman, Richard Dysart, Bruce Kirby, Rosemary Murphy, Boris Segal and Ted Post. Some of them were directors. Yeah, that's a fairly lengthy list of connections. Yeah, and there'll be more. That's just the ones that I immediately noticed. One or two other things here. Uh, Henry Jones, who I mentioned there, the connection is a little bit more tenuous. He starred in 13 episodes of Mrs. Columbo. Oh, you're going to get into trouble for that. And another chap who we'll discuss perhaps in a different special episode was a, a man called Bert Freed. Now, Columbo aficionados out there will be aware that Bert Freed was the first ever actor to play Lieutenant Columbo eight years before Peter Falk in 1960 in an episode of the Chevy Mystery Show. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Definitely one to consider covering in a a future special. Yes. Okay, where are we? We've got the season... Season wrap. We'll do the clues and everything from this week's episode when we get to it. But we'll start with the verdict for episodes one and two. Okay, Fade into murder. Yes, guilty. You think? Yes. Fingerprints on the bullets. Yeah, that's pretty convincing. Plus you've got the silver certificates that have come from him, the IOUs. The fact that he can be found to be a deserter, so motive, etc. Yeah, I think he's pretty much banged to rights. Yes. Old-fashioned murder. Oh, well, that was a weird one. He effectively f- had to force her so if she retracts it and says, no, I'll tell you what, you, you bring out this sort of dirty laundry in court. And see what you can prove. I don't think there's enough there for a conviction. It's a tricky one because they don't have the weapon, or they do have... The, oh, they have. They have their own, each had their own guns. So there's no way to place the gun at her. Nope. There's no way to place her at the scene. Nope. She doesn't have an alibi, but neither does anybody else because they've all been given their alibis for their own time. Mm-hmm. There is no... And the other evidence was the fact that the buckle had been planted on her niece's, or in her niece's wardrobe. Yeah, but Who could have done that? And even if even if she did do that, it doesn't prove that she killed somebody. Yeah. So I'm going to say she walks. Yes. But her family don't want to talk to her anymore. Yeah. Okay, this week. Clues. Well, well mot- uh, motive, first of all, is to avoid the... Yeah, he doesn't want to be exposed for his um, embezzling mm-hmm. of client funds. Yep, good enough uh, motive, I think. Yeah, it seems fair to me. Mm-hmm. Clues. A little bit messy, this one, but I'll go through them. Okay. The dictionary on the floor with the, the pens and the, yeah. the line on it. The angle of the bullets. Uh, the George's promotion over Metzler. Over who? Metzler. Is that his surname? Yeah. Alvin. Alvin Metzler. Okay. Yep. The time it took them, the missing sort of 30, why was a killer supposedly hanging yeah. around? Yeah, and then the doors that both yeah. operated. Yes. The discovery of soot on the, the floor, the fact that uh, Brandon needed money, the scratches on the record player, the record player being programmed to start and end at certain times, the scorch marks on the, the brawler, umbrella. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else? The other bit was when he put the pen up on the record player to show how that was done. Oh well, yeah. Well, that's the, that's that's the that's the gotcha, isn't it? Yeah. You've also theoretically got evidence from. George and or Alvin as to the other files. Yeah, but that goes towards motive, not murder. Yeah. Yeah, but the more you have. Of course. However, if this goes to court, here's what I, I, I think he, I don't think this is a cut and dry at all. Okay, where do you think his defence lies? So the whole sort of gotcha was him basically showing how you would do it. But his He's very smart, he would realise yes, that. His explanation would be, No, no, he's an idiot, this is what I would do. He he didn't say this is what I did do. He says, in fact, he actually says, no, no, what the killer would do is this. He says, what, what he would do is this. He doesn't say, I would do this. So he would simply say, yep, I worked out immediately because of a genius how I would do it if I was in that situation. So that gotcha part isn't a gotcha at all. It doesn't okay. prove anything. It proves that he's able to work that out. Yeah, well, we've got motive. We've got opportunity. Mm-hmm. So it's just whether you can say he definitely did it. His umbrella had scorch marks, which is damning. His... Um, gun wasn't found I don't think nope so we don't have that but 
We do have the four minutes from the phone call that ties him. Circumstantial. I think a lot of circumstantial here. I think he gets done for embezzlement. I'm not sure if he can be proven to be a killer. I think the scorch marks in the umbrella put him away. So we'll disagree on this one. Why? Does that, is that enough to put him away? I think that... Because remember, he's got Colombo and the team have to go to court mm-hmm. and convince a jury of this elaborate plot involving pens and, and, and firecrackers. Yeah, but there isn't an alternative, a plausible alternative. So the defence yeah, would have to come up with a yeah, plan. Yeah, there is. So the, the burglar. The burglar still hasn't been disproven. What's more likely, the simplest thing or the elaborate thing? Exactly. A burglar breaking in and shooting someone or this guy having firecrackers up umbrellas. Well, I suppose you've got a, an argument there. I'm going to go. I'm going to go guilty on embezzlement, not guilty. Not you know. Not it could be an Al Capone type thing where yeah. they put him away long enough on the embezzlement that it covers really. Yeah. What he would have had for the um, murder. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's going to prison. That's the bottom line. I think so. Yeah. So there we have it. We've came to the end of season six. The penultimate season of Columbo's run on NBC. Yes. Looking forward to starting the final season. Well. Yes. Five five episodes. Five episodes. So a month or so from now, we'll be talking about the the new run. Yes, talking oh. about our ten year gap. Yeah, that we're, that we're, we're going taking to a ten year gap in the podcast. Yeah, and we'll see you in twenty twenty five. Hopefully, well, we've got five more weeks. So don't worry. The thing is, we're negotiating just now to see if we get a better deal and become the highest paid podcasters. The highest paid Columbo podcasters on, on our network. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll see what we what we can do. I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling we might win out in the end. Well, we don't want to get folks' hopes up, but no. you might find that we slip in a little surprise for people between the, the original run and the, the new ones. We might. As always, let's finish, Ian, by thanking everyone who listens, who downloads, who streams, who contributes, who comments, who gives us all sorts of feedback. We love it, and we, well, to be honest, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be doing it at all. No, if we had no response at all, then we'd probably just pack it in. Yeah. But it's been fun, and hopefully it will continue to be fun for the, the rest of the way. Find us on columbopodcast.com. There's a blog post up there with the episodes on it, and you can comment, join in the conversation there. It's always very lively. Get us on Twitter at Columbo Podcast, Facebook, which I think is facebook.com slash Columbo Podcast. Mm. But in any event, you can search for us on Facebook. If you have the time to leave us a wee star rating and ideally even a review on iTunes, if you enjoy the show, please do do that because it helps more people find the show, which means there's more folk chatting and it's more fun for everybody. And we will see you back here for season seven. With Try and Catch Me. Okay, we'll see you then. Bye bye. Cheerio. have been listening to the Colombo podcast from Herd Yet Media.